Hey everyone, it's me, Nate, Lost in Time and Space, back again with this month's Arkham News Roundup. In this series, I go over news, product releases, and general happenings within the Cthulhu gaming world over the previous month. If you enjoyed this series, don't forget to leave this video a thumbs up, and if you don't want to miss when my videos go live, hit the subscribe button to become one of the many that are lost in time and space. As always, links to all the news featured in this video will be in the description. June was a busy month, so without further ado, let's get right into the news. Firing announcement one after the other at us like it was going out of style, FFG announced in June three new expansions for its various Arkham Horror Files games, the first of which was the fifth campaign cycle for the Arkham LCG. The Dream Years. To paraphrase the website here, this deluxe expansion kicks off the fifth cycle of Arkham Horror the card game. Players take on the roles of either group of investigators venturing into the dreamlands or their companions who have been left in the waking world. Complete with 95 scenario cards and 56 player cards, this expansion contains the first two scenarios of the Dream Eater cycle, one for each of these two groups. Pre-ordering this product through FFG's site, you'll also get eight 5x7 art prints from the new expansion. FFG has done this in the past with products such as the 2019 calendars they released last year, and the prints were double-sided, meaning you can only see half of the art at one time. Hopefully they avoid that this time. The initial card fan spoils a new Mystic card and the Ancient Zug enemy, along with teasing some other cards. As for details on the campaign itself, the article goes on to say that the Dream Eater cycle will comprise of two four-part campaigns by combining one of the scenarios from the base box with three of the six Mythos packs. Alternatively, you can take all the Mythos packs and the Deluxe box to form a standard eight-part campaign. Given the monthly release schedule of the game, it might be awkward to have to wait two months to continue campaign if you're playing this on release day. That being said, said though, I like the idea of more mini campaigns in the Arkham LCG. We haven't received a mini campaign since the days of the corset, and I, for one, really like the idea of being able to play through one of these campaigns in one or two sessions. The article also reveals Luke Robinson, one of the new investigators included in the Dream Eaters, along with his signature cards. The guys and I on the Great Old Ones Gaming Podcast discussed this topic at length on our most recent episode, so if you're interested in our first impressions of Luke, you can check that out. The Man From Lang also put out a great video going into depths into aspects of this campaign, from the lore of the Dreamlands, potential investigators we might see, to the types of enemies you could expect. I highly recommend you check that out. And if that wasn't enough for you, FFG also announced that on July 11th, designer Matt Newman will be live providing deck building tips with the new player cards from the Dream Eaters. This product is expected to release quarter three of this year. My guess would be October, July and August see the release of In the Clutches of Chaos and Before the Black Throne, finishing the Circle Undone campaign. From there, I could see FFG releasing the Return to Carcosa in September, and then starting the new cycle in October. FFG had a similar release schedule last year with Return to Dunwich going into Circle Undone, but maybe they switched things up this year. I guess we'll have to wait and see. The Arkham LCG is but only one of the Arkham Files games to receive a new expansion announcement this month. First with a live stream, then posting an article on their site, FFG revealed the first expansion for the Arkham Horror 3rd Edition board game. Quote, In Dead of Night, investigators explore the facets of Arkham best left unseen in the light of day. Organized crime builds a strong foothold in the city, secret cults labor for a dark master, an alien moon hangs overhead, and an unknowable horror stalks the night. This expansion includes two all-new scenarios, new encounters for every location in Arkham, new monsters and anomalies, a new monster deck holder, and four new investigators to face these fresh horrors, armed with new spells, items, and allies. The initial product fan shows us Skids and Kate Winthrop's investigator cards, the new monster deck holder, along with spoiling a new item and enemy. Judging from this image, it's also safe to assume that Diana Stanley will be in this expansion as well. The scenario in Dead of Night we'll see the players getting between the Warren Gangs, the Sheldons, and the Omanians to figure out why they're hellbent on not only destroying their rivals, but all of Arkham as well. The article goes on to overview skids and a couple more cards which I'll put on the screen for you now. I like the idea of the new wanted condition. It really helps to drive home the idea of playing an ex-con who pickpockets for money to help pay for his mother's hospital debts. Mm, wait, wrong game. In their livestream announcement, Philip Henry goes into more detail about the scenarios included in this expansion, along with spoiling one of the investigators included in the box. If you missed the live stream of this announcement, you can find the archive on Twitch as well as on YouTube. Alright, we're finally in the last announcement from FFG. Marking the fifth expansion for Mansions of Madness, Path of the Serpent sees the investigators traveling into the unexplored jungles of the Amazon to hopefully stop the curse of Yig. Great callback, by the way. For fans of the LCG, this will instantly remind you of the Forgotten Age campaign, which is only reinforced when we see who is in the Path of the Serpent. Leo Anderson and Ursula Downs make their return for more jungle shenanigans, along with Daniela Reyes and Norman Withers. 
The article shows an image of the minis included in this expansion, and they look great, and I'm excited to see what they look like painted. From there, the article goes into some detail about the story threads of the three scenarios, which I don't want to spoil details for anyone that's curious, so again, link will be in the description if you want to check that out for yourself. So unless you've been sleeping under the seas in Cthulhu's home of Relier, you'll have no doubt heard about the Sinking City by this point. Released at the end of June, the Sinking City sees the player take on the role of Charles Reed, a private eye in the fictional 1920s town called Oakmont, to investigate a mysterious flood that has nearly taken the entire city, hence the name Sinking City. As you no doubt have guessed from the title of the slide, reviews are mixed for this game. Many reviews stated complaints such as bad performance, the UI being frustrating and time consuming to use, NPCs glitching in and out of the world or behaving strangely, and combat overall feeling lackluster. In addition to this, many players and reviewers noticed a lot of the interior areas of the game looked similar to each other, often reusing assets and map layouts. One thing, however, that people seem to generally agree upon is that the story for the game is pretty good, which is obviously the main reason you'd want to play this game. Reddit user The Partisan Spy did a great infographic style review for The Sinking City and sums up his review by saying, The Sinking City bets everything on its story. All earned and missed points are results of how the story performed with all other game variables. The downside of this bet is that when the story didn't perform well, other elements, such as combat, weren't strong enough to compensate it. The Sinking City had a huge potential of being an amazing game if all variables were as strong as the story. This, I think, captures a large consensus about this title. I was wary of this title when I'd heard the news of it being an epic exclusive, and reviews only helped to cement my skepticism. If you haven't already taken the plunge into Oakmont, I think it's worth waiting until the game goes on sale to pick this up. At least, that's what I'll be doing. The last piece of news I quickly wanted to mention is that Critical Role will be playing a Call of Cthulhu one-shot in the next few weeks. On Monday, July 29th, Critical Role's Taliesin Jaffe is stepping behind the screen once again as Keeper of Arcane Lore for a special Call of Cthulhu one-shot, sponsored by our friends at Chaosium. Investigators Travis Willingham, Liam O'Brien, Marsha Ray, Ashley Birch, Phil Lamar, and Erica Ishii will attempt to survive Taliesin's harrowing scenario, which is set in a decadent 1890s London. We're incredibly excited to explore this classic RPG of cosmic horror through a fresh lens. VOD will be immediately available for our Twitch channel subscribers and will be available on our YouTube channel on Wednesday, July 31st. Far too long has D&D had a stranglehold on the RPG spotlight. Decadent 1890s London suggests to me Cthulhu Gaslight, a Victorian-era setting for Call of Cthulhu. Chaosium seems to be on a bit of a tear lately, first appearing on Penny Arcade and now appearing on Critical Role. I hope this is only the beginning for more professional Call of Cthulhu content. I'm super excited for this. And with that, that's going to do it for this month's Arkham News Roundup. What did you think about this month's news? Which Arkham Files product are you most excited for? Did you pick up The Sinking City? And if you did, what do you think about it? Leave your thoughts down in the comments below. Thank you as always for watching, and have a great day.